welcome everyone to this uh, fifth and last lecture of this little series. Thank you for coming again. I really appreciate it. The topic of today's discussion and lecture is uh, the independence hierarchy, and in particular, the status of the independence concepts in algebraic quantum field theory. And here's the outline of the lecture. I have already claimed, and it is true, that there is a whole bunch of independent notions in uh, algebraic quantum mechanics. And it's very easy to get lost in this maze of different independent concepts. But it is helpful to keep in mind that there's a core idea of independence which gets specified in different ways, in different formulations in terms of algebraic quantum mechanics. And I will start by describing this general idea of independence, because once you have this general idea, it's much easier to understand and comprehend the whole hierarchy. Once we have this general idea, I will specify this general idea according to the literature in many different ways. So I will just recall the view different standard independence notions, and we will see that they are just really versions, different versions, different technical specifications of the same general idea. And of course, if you have a series of definitions, a list of definitions, then the question arises as to what the relation, the logical relation among the different uh, independence concepts are. And then I will present you some results on this issue. Not all, I'm not even familiar with all, it is such a huge topic. But the, the major results which are known about the interdependence of the independence notions will be presented here. So that's the third issue here. Once this is done, I turn my attention to the notion of operation, and I will make several comments, recall some well-known facts about operations. And I do this uh, with the intention of defining a notion of independence, which is formulated in terms of operations. And here I'm recalling uh, concepts which I myself have had to uh, design and will then present you a couple of uh, propositions about how this operational independence notion is related to the hierarchy of other independence. Once this is done, we turn our attention to a closely related notion called notion of uh, notion of operational separability. This is an independence concept whose origin go back, as I will claim, to Einstein's criticism of standard quantum mechanics. We will see how. And then I will relate these two notions to each other, and I will ask what the status of this operational separability is in algebraic quantum field theory. And we will see uh, that uh, just like operational independence, operational separability holds typically in quantum field theory. Once this is done, I will put an extra twist on the notion of operational independence and operational separability by specifying further subclasses of these notions which lead to new questions about the relation of uh, different subclasses of operational separability and independence concept, about which essentially nothing is known, so there's a lot of open problems I will present you with the diagram which shows how much is not known about the relation, logical relation of these different notions. So this is the plan, quite a long plan, plan and I have 58 slides. I hope I can flash all of them. If you are running out of time, I will skip some. The main message, in every lecture there is a main, simple main message, and I hope you don't mind the simplicity of the main messages, which I have 
uh, designed uh, at the beginning of all lectures. And the main message here is also very simple, namely that there is a very rich hierarchy of interdependent, non-equivalent, independent notions in algebraic quantum field theory. And the local systems associated with space-like separated space-time regions in the sense of the total algebraic quantum field theory typically satisfy the strongest independence notion. So this is very reassuring as a message that algebraic quantum field theory is all right from the perspective of our intuition. Remember, the intuition is that this theory really embodies locality and causality in an intuitively uh, compelling fashion. Okay, so preliminary remarks on independence. Uh, this is partly repeating what I just said. These independence notions are crucial for the algebraic approach to quantum field theory because we intend to have a theory here which is complying with the causality principle understood along the lines of the special theory of relativity, that is to say, space-like separated systems should be independent. And our model, mathematical model, should reflect that independence. Okay, so that's what we expect and it's very important. The other preliminary remark is that the independence notions of the, independent, the situations in which we encounter this problem of independence is typically the situations in which we have two systems which can be regarded as part of a larger system. Just imagine two space-like separated open bounded regions, say cones, double cones. You can imagine the large double cone that uh, encloses, that contains both, so then the independence of these two systems is conceived of, is created as independence within the large system. This will be important, and this is typically the situation. Another preliminary comment is, and this is good to keep in mind, is that the notion of independence is not theory independent. There's no absolute notion of independence. You don't know what independence need is in abstract. Okay? There's no philosophical or physical or whatever notion of independence that would be independent of the special context in which you try to specify, okay? So uh, it's not a theory independent notion. And also it's good to know that it's not unique even if you fix a special context, as we will see very clearly, even if you fix your theory to be non-commutative probability theory, the notion of independence can be formulated in many different non-equivalent ways. And therefore, the interdependence of the independence notions is an interesting, emerging, and typically very difficult problem. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, what is the definition of the term, the notion of independence? Which do you have some uh, super definition of some mathematical definition of the, each of these uh, hierarchies or something like you are leading basically uh, for uh, what did you call independence? But the, I claimed here there is no abstract notion of independence which would be uh, somehow independent of what your theory is. That's, that's the claim. But there is, in the special context in which we are encountering this in physics, in quantum physics in particular, a core idea which is informal, it's not specific, and in some sense it uh, encompasses all the other independence notions. But it's intuitive and it is not technical. When it comes to technical formulations, there are different technical formulations of essentially the same idea. But again, this idea, even this more general idea, is not uh, something which is uh, universal. That is to say, there are notions of independence which are not of the sort, not of the specification of the core idea which I'm presenting here. Just to give you an example, but, but it should become clear as we go along what this core idea is, and then when we see, once we see what the core idea is, we might want to think about 
other independent concepts which do not fall under this more general term of uh, concept of independence. For so example, the classical property theory. Mm. Independence is usually considered about the relation with, for, with these two events or two sub Boolean um, yes. uh, or two uh, random variables. Yes. And uh, in that case, the uh, independence is statistical independence, and which is characterized by uh, information about the one variable does not uh, change the probability uh, distribution of the other uh, variable. Uh, for example, if you use the base principle, you, you are uh, information about the occurrence of the uh, results of the one experiment uh, does not uh, change your uh, posterior probability from yes. the prior probability. Yes. Uh, so this is one mm, clear definition uh, of the independence in classical probability theory. And there are lots of the research in uh, quantum generalizations which find independence, for example, independence in free probability theory or something like that. Uh, uh, how your uh, notion of independence is different or related to those uh, uh, research? Well, I, we will see this in the end. Well, um, first of all, there are standard notions of independence, uh, which, again, I, I, okay, here, is, here is the claim again. There are lots and lots of independence notions in science. We have just described one in classical probability. There are ones in free probability theory. There are ones in operator algebra theory. There are ones in uh, logic. There are lots and lots of independence notions out there. That was my claim. Namely, there's no unique abstract notion of independence. The notion of independence is theory dependent. Once you fix your theory, you can design your independence notion within that theory. And that independence notion might not make sense in another context, or might not be formulable uh, in another context. So the, the point I'm making here is that you should not think of the independence as a uniquely fixed notion somehow. There are different sorts of independence notions, even if you are in the same theory. For instance, if you're in classical probability theory, there's this uh, popular statistical independence notion you just described. But of course, there is the Boolean algebra there on which the probability measure is defined. And one can define, as we have seen uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, you can define logical independence, which doesn't refer at all to probabilities. It only refers to the Boolean operations, which are part of probability. So you have, even there, two different independence notions. And the, the point I'm making here is that this is typical. The independence notion is not unique. It is theory dependent. There are many of them. And it is a reasonable question to ask how they are related. Now, and this is what I'm going to talk about. Now, you might want to say that some of the independence notions are more attractive intuitively than others, which is some sort of a philosophical or interpretational question. Which independence notion do you think expresses better the causal independence of space-like separated regions? Well, this is a question which doesn't really have a unique answer, I believe. You might want to argue that, say, logical independence in that particular case is much weaker in some intuitive sense than, say, uh, C star independence. So I think the issue is uh, is complex in the sense that there are no unique notions of independence, perhaps contrary to what one might have expected, and also uh, the problem of which of the independence notions you prefer over the others. That's a difficult and interpretational and philosophical question. For instance, we know. 
I claimed on the first slide in the main message that certain that the strongest independence notions do hold in quantum field theory, typically, but not always. And you might want to say that you are unhappy about that. That this is a problematic theory after all, because certain independence notions, the strongest one, do not hold in certain situations in quantum field theory. And then you might want to say, well, that theory is unfortunately contradicting our intuition or the special theory of relativity, a possible position to take. Okay, so this is this is the situation. I think the I, issue I'd like to know more categorical uh, sense. Uh, you, you, you wrote that the independence of the space is like by the local system. So the, can I understand that is, uh, your notion of your notion of independence is something uh, for or two systems or two observables or two events or for, for what? You see, you are you are just confirming my point. One can talk about independence of systems. One can talk about independence of events. One can talk about independence of many other things, of probability measures, of state preparations. These are conceptually different ideas. And you might want to say, in the case of space-like separated systems, I expect independence in all three senses of what we have just specified. Events should be independent. Events should be logically independent. Events should be probabilistically independent. Systems should be independent. Preparations of states should be independent, and so on. And so this is, this is a possible position to take, that you expect all sorts of independence features to hold for that situation. And the question is, is this true? Is that expectation met? Does the theory satisfy these expectations? That is to say, does the theory satisfy these independence conditions? And the situation then is essentially that the answer to this question is yes, the theory satisfies the strongest independence condition, typically. Not always, and this is the uh, issue which I, which I referred to previously. You might want to say that whenever, if, if, this is, if it is not the case that for all space-like separated systems, all independence concepts are valid, then we are unhappy about the theory. But if, if, the, if you are, this is, a, again, a philosophical I don't see that I have satisfied your desire, but I, let me suggest that we go on a little bit, and then we return to this issue at the end, okay? <laughs> Good, so here is the general idea of independence. I claim that there is a core idea of informal, informal idea, technically not explicit, but a core idea which is behind most of the independence notions, which I'm going to present which are standard in the literature, okay? And this is the subsystem idea of independence. Uh, so suppose you have two subsystems, S1 and S2, of a larger system, S. Then you would want to say that these two are independent if the following is the case. Anything which is possible in principle, theoretically, for, for the system S1 as a system in its own right, and anything which is possible in principle for a system S2 in its own right are jointly possible in principle for the pair viewed as a subsystem of S. Let me illustrate this, this idea. Uh, again, this is an informal idea uh, and a very elementary example. Suppose I had a friend, okay? And uh, in this hot weather, we want to have a drink in the evening and he, in his home, has a refrigerator which has, I don't know, Coke, Sprite, mineral water, whiskey, wine, beer. I have the same in my refrigerator. When do we say, when would we say that we, these two persons, are independent? When? Well, when if it is the case that no matter what he chooses from his fridge, does not prohibit me from choosing anything from my fridge. That is to say, any two choices from the two refrigerators are possible as a state of the verb. Okay. 
that's when I, this is, this is the idea here. Then I would say that he is independent in his choice of me. Okay, that's the idea. Any two choices are co-possible, possible state of the verb. Okay? If he chooses co, that, that does not prohibit me from choosing anything from my fridge. If he's choosing co, it would prohibit me from choosing, say, mineral water, then I would not call us in that the respect independent. Okay? So that's the that's the core idea. And I'm going to present you now specifications of this idea in the context of algebraic quantum mechanics. Here's the first definition, which we have already encountered. I very briefly uh, presented you this definition because in connection with the violation of Bell's inequality, it was needed. Okay? The idea is here that if you have two C star subalgebras of the larger algebra, then any two partial states on the subalgebras have a joint extension of the large algebra. Okay. You see that it is the same, it, it is the manifestation of the same idea, of the core idea. Any two partial C star states can be jointly declared. Any two partial states uh, are a possible state of the large system. Okay? That's the idea. All right, uh, second definition. A pair of C star subalgebras of the C star algebra C is called C star independent in the product sense if this map here extends to a C star isomorphism of the generated, uh, generated C star algebra in C by A1 and A2 with the minimal tensor product uh, of the two C star algebra. It's more or less obvious, more or less, but again, uh, in some sense, it's not obvious in how this relation, what the relation of C star independence in the product stands is related to C star independence. It's more or less obvious that if this is the case, then separate states can be jointly extended because you, have, you, you just take the product state. Does the converse hold? Unclear. Again, you see immediately how the problem of the relation between different independence concepts emerges. Next definition, W star independence. Two von Neumann algebras, of the von Neumann algebra, M, are called B star, w star independent if for any normal state on one of them and for any normal state on the other, there's a normal extension of them to the large one. So the idea is that any two partial normal states have a joint extension as a normal state. Next, W sign independence in the product sense. Two von Neumann algebras are W sign dependent in the product sense if for any normal state on one and any normal state on the other have a joint extension which is a product across the algebra. Okay? So any two normal states have a joint product extension. W star independence in the spatial, spatial product sense, which is very much like the C star independence in the product sense, namely they are independent in this sense if this map extends to spatial isomorphism implemented on the, on the level of the state of the Hilbert spaces. Okay. Next one. Split property. A pair of von Neumann algebras are called split if there exists a type 1 factor pH such that the type 1 factor separates M1 from the commutant of M2. This is the commutant. The split properties uh, not immediately clear that it expresses an independent condition, but I will claim later on in the hierarchy that this is indeed the case. And although I, I'm unable to uh, detail this here, the split property is very important in algebraic quantum theory in, in the operator algebra theory in general. It's a crucial, it's a crucial property. Okay. 
Okay, but it's not, yeah, I'm just emphasizing its meaning, its significance as an independence property. Logical independence. Two phenomena algebras are called logically independent. If you just consider the two projection lattices, which are supposed to be regarded as logics of the system, um, and then it is the case that no matter how you take one projection from one and another projection from the other, if they are non-zero, their intersection is non-zero. We have encountered that in the Boolean setting yesterday, and I have mentioned this already today. This essentially means that any two non-self-contradictory propositions of the sum from the subsystems can be jointly true. The truth of any proposition on one system does not exclude the, proper, the truth of any other proposition on the other system. This is clearly an independence condition. Okay? Strict locality. A pair of non-nominal algebras acting in a Hilbert space satisfies strict locality if for any projection in one of the, uh, the projection like this is, there exists a normal, uh, and uh, for any, every normal state on the other, there exists a normal state on the large, uh, Algebra, such that the probability of the projection is one, and that normal state coincides with the normal state on the other. Algebra. So no preparation of any state on the subsystem represented by M2 can exclude the truth of any proposition on the other system, M1. Okay. I have presented you with a list of definitions. I hope you are a bit confused. By seeing, if you have if you have not seen this before, then you should be confused. So those students here who have not seen this before and are confused by this list of definitions are a bit confused. That's all right because it's difficult to digest all this and comprehend what's going on. And in case the issue emerges as to what the relation between these different independence concepts. And I promised you that I will present you some results on this. This has been subject of research in quantum field theory for a long time, and there are open questions still. And here are some results, some propositions. This picture, which I also flashed in the first lecture, if you remember, and I promised that I'm going to return to that. This is the time to detail a little bit what's going on. So here are the uh, different notions. And here are some of the known facts about them. Okay. I'm not detailing all, because I've not even left defined all of them, but most of them I have defined. The arrows mean entailment. Cross arrows means it's known that it is not entailed. Okay. C indicates that the commutativity of the sub-algebras is assumed. If you remember, all of the definitions concerned two sub-operator uh, algebras of a larger operator algebra, and I didn't assume that they are commuting, okay? Now, you can assume it, and then that's an extra condition, and in some cases under these extra conditions, you can know something about the relation of the, of the independence conditions on such systems. So here are some of the propositions. The split property is equivalent logically to the W star independence in the spatial problem sense. And that's the, these are the strongest independence notions that entail W star independence in the product sense, product sense, which is equivalent with the W star tensor product structure if you assume commutativity. That is to say, if W star independence in the product sense holds and the two phenomena algebras are assumed to be commutative, then this is equivalent to saying that the two von Neumann algebras uh, uh, generate the von Neumann algebra, which is isomorphic to the tensor product of them. And this entails W star independence. But W star, w star independence does not entail W star independence in the product sense. So this is strictly stronger than W star independence. Recall W star independence was that any two normal states have a joint extension. W star independence in the product sense meant that any joint 
added two normal states and a joint extension, which is a product state that does the touch address. This is an extra condition, and it is strictly stronger, it's a strictly stronger notion than Davista independence. Davista independence is equivalent to C star independence if the phenomenon algebras are assumed to be commuting. If they are assumed, if they are not assumed to be commuting, then doggy star independence is not entailed by C star independence. There are counterexamples. Just a side remark, Jan Hamhalter, the Czech uh, quantum probability theorist, a very fine mathematician, is the expert on uh, the abstract uh, investigation of independence, not in the quantum field theory context. In the quantum field theory context, it's probably Stephen Summers who's the third leading expert on this. But in general, Jan Hamhalter from the Czech Republic Technical University, he proved that a W star independence and C star independence is not equivalent. Uh, because if you don't assume the commutativity of the subalgebras, then W star independence is not entailed by C star. Okay, C star independence is entailed by the C star tensor product structure, C star independence in the product sense. The converse is not true, however. The C star independence in the product sense is strictly stronger than C star independence. W star independence entails strict locality. Converse is true on that you can assume assumption of commutativity, and they entail C star independence and the converse too, if the commutativity is assumed. C star independence is equivalent to logical independence if commutativity is assumed. But if commutativity, commuta that's not a good expression. Commut by commutativity, I mean that the two subalgebras are assumed to be commuting, but that's a too long uh, uh, wording, so I'm just saying commutativity. So C star independence is equivalent to logical independence if you assume that the subalgebras are commuting, but if they are not assumed to be, then uh, they are not equivalent. C star independence does not entail logical independence. Excuse me. Yes. I mean strict locality. Strict locality was defined here. Oops. So you pick a projection from one of the projection lattices and you fix a normal state on the other system, then there will be a normal state on B of H, which makes that proposition true and which coincides with the normal state on the other algebra. So no preparation of any state on the subsystem represented by M2 can exclude the truth of any proposition on the other system. It's a kind of uh, this is it. So there are two systems. You make a proposition, you make a statement about, say, the value of, the, of an observable on one system, and you fix a state on the other. Okay. Then there will be a state of the large system which makes that proposition true and coincides with that state here on that. All right. So. Okay, you see, you see the conditions are uh, non-trivial, and that there have, I have presented you with I don't know 18 propositions, like roughly or or a sum. Anyway, what do you mean? Since that one of the states. Okay, if they are if if two systems are sister independent, that means that if, however you choose one state here and another state there, they have a joint extension. Now, it is known that if this is the case, then the joint extension can be assumed to be a product state, okay? All right, and there is more. Uh, again, it's a huge topic. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, but I don't mind necessarily. Um, and uh, it has been topic of an intense research. There's a wonderful review paper by Stephen Summers, again, he's the leading expert on this. It, it was published in 1990 in the Review of, of Mathematical Physics. He summarizes uh, the independence uh, hierarchy beautifully. 
And there is more. There is even more I have not presented you with all which are known. And uh, I myself don't know everything in this field either. I would like now to turn to a specific notion of independence, which is relatively new, which I introduced, and uh, with Stephen Summers, and say something about this kind of uh, independence. Because I think it makes sense and it leads to new open questions. To do that, I will uh, say a few words about the notion of operation, which again, I assume is quite well known, so I, I can be very quick. I'm recalling some very standard uh, concepts and notions here. A CP map, a completely positive unit preserving map on, a, on, on an algebra is called an operation, and it's called a normal operation. It continues in the uh, algebraic topology if the algebra is a non algebra algebra. And we know that the dual of an operation acts in the state spaces of these algebras, uh, maps the state space of the sister algebra into itself, and normal state states get mapped into normal states if the operation is normal. Examples of such CP maps, the notion of CP map or operation is quite general. It contains the notion of state. States can be identified with CP maps by this definition for any A in a sister algebra, you, you assign the expectation of A times the identity. This is an element of the algebra itself. And this is the, this can be identified with the state itself. So states are known to be uh, operations, completely positive maps. Conditional expectations from an algebra into a subalgebra. It's a conditional expectation if it's linear uh, and if it's a projection onto the subalgebra. In particular, the conditional expectation, which is very familiar from standard quantum mechanics, the non-selective projection postulate, is a conditional expectation to that subalgebra. And these are all completely positive. These have to be proved, not easy, or not difficult to prove. Good. The classic results on the notion of operation <coughs> The most well-known is perhaps the Stein-Spring representation theorem. The Stein-Spring representation theorem says that if you have an operation from a C-star algebra into the set of all bounded operators on some Hilbert space, then it has a specific canonical form. This form, namely, where pi is a representation of the C-star algebra A into the bounded operators over some Hilbert space. K, and K uh, is related to H, to this H, by uh, isomorphism. Okay, so all CP maps into the set of bounded operators over Hilbert space are of this form. It's a very useful representation theorem, and uh, uh, used extensively in quantum information. This is very well known in quantum a consequence of this theorem is uh, perhaps even better known. It's called the Krauss representation theorem. If you have a CP map on a set of four bounded operators, uh, into the set of four bounded operators, then it has this particular form. If it's a normal operation, then it has this form, okay, where these WIs are uh, summing up to one, and they are called the Krauss operators. This is really a, a corollary of the science All right, I assume that you know this very well. Comments on this, which are important. Very important, although by quantum information theorists who mainly work in the finite dimensional Hilbert space framework, not very well known. Uh, Namely, that the uh, Krauss theorem characterizes operations on, the, on a very specific C star algebra, namely the set of all bounded operators. And the Krauss theorem is not true for arbitrary operations defined on arbitrary C star or W star algebra. And this is because, uh, and this is related to another issue which, is, which makes life very difficult. 
if every operation on a C star or a W star algebra did have a Krauss representation, then every operation defined on any subalgebra, A naught of a C star algebra, would have an extension from the subalgebra to the large algebra, which is, however, not true. This makes the theory of operations, I believe, much more interesting than it is typically assumed to be. And it makes also life very difficult. Because if you don't have a representation of an object, then it's very difficult to compute. Here's a famous theorem which characterizes maps, CP maps, which do have extensions from subalgebra to the uh, large algebra. Suppose you have a CP map which uh, is defined on a subalgebra A naught of a C star algebra A, and it takes its values in the set of all bounded operators on a Hilbert space. Then that T can be extended from A naught to A to a CP map. That's a, called Arvison's theorem. It was proved in the 60s by the famous mathematician Arvison. And it's very important that uh, the range of T is B of H. It goes into B of H. And uh, it is a very strong assumption. And it's essentially uh, analogous to, uh, the, uh, to the situation of which represented by the states. If you have a state defined on a subalgebra of an algebra, and that state can always be extended. That's the content of the Hahnemann theorem. Okay. So B of H here behaves like the set of complex numbers behaves for states. But in general, this is not the case. That is to say, Arvison's theorem does not generalize to a general of, of algebra in place of B of H. Uh, the related definition is the following. A C star algebra is called injective if the following is the case. If for any C star algebra A and for any C star subalgebra A not of A, it holds that if you have a CP map on the subalgebra into C, um, then uh, that CP map can be extended from the subalgebra into uh, a CP map on the large algebra. Again, an algebra is called injective if it is the case that no matter if you should take another algebra and a subalgebra of it and you define a CP map from the subalgebra into that one, then that map can be extended to the large one. Okay. So the Han Banach theorem, which, uh, to which I alluded uh, a couple of minutes ago, uh, can be reformulated in this definition as this claim that the set of complex numbers as a commutative C structure is injective. And Arvison's theorem can be reformulated as the claim that the set of all bounded operators on a Hilbert space is injective. But not all algebras are injective. Okay? Which algebras are injective? This is a very deep result which was uh, obtained essentially as a result of Alan Cohn's theory that for non algebra in a separate algebra space is injected if and only if it is approximately finite dimensional. Which means that there is an increasing sequence of finite dimensional mat full matrix algebras within that algebra which generate the algebra. Okay? So not every algebra is injective, and we have a complete characterization of injective algebras. And this is really wonderful in some sense. Why? Because if you remember, I mentioned that in algebraic quantum field theory, the local algebras are type 3, uh, type 3, 1 algebras, which are hyperfinite as well. They are injective, therefore. So injective. And, and why is that important? You will see that this leads to, it, it has a, a physical, operational uh, significance because then in that context, the extension, extendability of operations is ensured, at least for those local algebras that are 
type of firearm. Okay. Now I come to the issue of operation of siege star and dog star independence. This slide contains four definitions. The first definition is that uh, two local algebras are operationally C star independent in a larger algebra associated with the bounded space dimension. If any two normal operations, if any two operations, not normal in the first round, have a joint 